many people actually equate innovation with technology. And I can debunk that in one second. You know what a Scantron is, right? And when I talk about a Scantron, it is often seen as accelerated bad learning. And what I mean by that, I, when I was a high school teacher, we got a Scantron in our school. And as soon as I saw that we had a Scantron, basically everything I did went to multiple choice. And it had nothing to do with, does this deepen student learning? Is this actually making my kids better? It was all about what would make my life easier. And I'm not saying if you use a Scantron, you're an evil person. And I know people have said, hey, I use this in ways that really helps me improve student learning. And if you're that person, I'd love to hear in your comments how you use a Scantron um, to accelerate awesome learning for our kids. I would love to learn from you. And I think um, thinking about how we use technology to really deepen the learning of our students is something I'm really focused on. And when we talk about innovation, it's about new and better ways of learning, not only for our students, but for ourselves. And that's why I really loved having Eric Kuntz on the podcast. Eric and I met at a conference. I had the pleasure to speak at a GATC, one of my favorite conferences I've ever had the opportunity to speak at. Just a huge conference with tons of events, but it made it feel really small. Uh, there is such a community feel and it is something that I always loved about those types of conferences is that you have a ton of choice, but you feel really welcome and valued. And Eric and I met there um, talking about basketball shoes. Uh, we connected there and, and I met a lot of people through Eric and hopefully Eric met some people through me. And one of the things that he said today when we did this podcast was he really focused on in his role as an ed tech uh, specialist, how do we actually use technology to improve student learning? And how do we utilize this? And so that's why I thought about the Scantron story. So you're going to love Eric. He's such a positive light in the world. I really appreciate having this conversation with him. And so before you listen, I, I hope you can subscribe on YouTube, um, like this podcast, because it really helps to get amazing people like Eric out into the world to learn from him. And uh, I feel blessed that I, was, I met him face to face and we've stayed connected through social media since then. And I know you're going to really appreciate his ideas, his thoughts, and the incredible work he does. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, it's George Kroos. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And I actually have Eric Koontz on the podcast today. He is an ed tech specialist, right? That's what the title you have at Price Middle School. Uh, it is a school, uh, you know, connected with Atlanta Public, uh, Atlanta Public Schools. And uh, Eric and I met at uh, GATC, which is, a, I'm going to, you know what, GATC, uh, Georgia Ed Tech, an Ed Tech Conference, one of my favorite conferences ever. <laughs> going to give them a little shout out. One of the, you know, I'll, I'll say this just as a side. Um, one of the things that I loved about that conference was how many options there was for sessions, how big it was, and how mm -hmm. small they made it feel. And I don't know if that makes any sense. Like it was so, and it was like, and I can, and one of the reasons I say that um, is because uh, it was so easy to connect with people like yourself, Eric, because we just met there. I saw you yeah. had, first of all, I dapped you up for some shoes you had on. And then you yeah. noticed I was, I remember I was wearing Jordan twos because they were those were speaking yeah, shoes. Yeah. Those uh -huh. were speaking shoes, my Jordan twos. Mm -hmm. they, they like go with anything, but they're right. And then as soon as I connected with you, People saw me talking to you and then all of a sudden I, you know, I was cool. And then everyone else started talking to me and it just made me feel so very welcome, like connecting with you. And that's like one of the small town um, feels about that. And so um, you can actually see Eric's uh, Instagram handle there uh, on the screen as well. And Eric and I actually uh, connected, you know, ever since then. And I got to tell this story. I, I told, we talked about this first. So I, you know, everyone knows I love basketball and, uh, I spoke at the conference. We had an awesome session. People were just pumped up. And then, so this is in Atlanta. And then, and then about a few hours later, I was actually at in Orlando at the Warriors That's versus funny. Magic game. And Eric, yeah. he's like, "You're already at the game? Like, <laughs> what the heck?" And I like flew, hit my car, got went right to the game because I didn't want to miss that game. And so, so we just stayed connected ever since, right? Yeah. And it was just funny, and it's kind of neat. Um, Eric, I didn't know anything about you before Eric. Um, mm -hmm. and so I made it at the conference and a lot of times it's weird for me is I meet people, 
um, on social media and then meet him face to face. But I loved it because we met face to face and then we stayed connected over social media. Yes, so media, yeah. I just, I absolutely love it. So Eric is just a totally inspirational guy. Does some really amazing things. So Eric, if you can just tell everyone a little bit about yourself, what you do today and how you got there, I think that's a great place to start. Okay. So um, like I said, my name is Eric Coons. I'm an EdTech specialist or instructional technology coach at Price Middle School. Um, I got my start in science. So my background is science and certified teach science in ELA. Um, and I did ELA because of course we know that a lot of the times, you know, I'm black and brown minority kids, they, they kind of struggle in literacy. So I just wanted to make sure that I can really um, teach something in which I can make an impact in. And then of course, science, I love science. And then when it comes to STEM, then of course, once again, you know, we have a mission of putting our uh, unrepresented minorities in STEM and science careers. So I just feel like those really those two contents were very instrumental and impactful. And so um, in teaching science though, cause I, you know, I, I always tell the principal, listen, you want me to teach LA? I can do it. Now I may put my kids back a couple <laughs> of years but at this point, right? <laughs> but um, I can do it, but no science, but I just have a love for science. And um, science was just always, there was always an easier way for me um, to just, you know, tie in technology into, you know, into science to make it, you know, more engaging, uh, more personalized right. for my students to un for help them to understand concepts, to connect the real world um, with the content. It's just technology was, was just the way to go. And so um, technology is my thing. I enjoyed it and I loved it. I love experiences that it gave my children, my scholars. And so um, I was transitioning, you know, I was about to leave a school and the uh, principal who did a walkthrough, my class was always, and I'll never forget, and I probably would never forget my, no, I will. But um, the, uh, my class was never always the first, one. Never forget your first podcast. <laughs> right. Never forget your first podcast. <laughs> and so um, the principal, she brought all the, because we have a small cluster within APS called the Carpet Cluster. Yeah. So all the principals in the cluster came to my classroom. And um, I was implementing technology. We were doing small groups. Um, so we were doing small groups, implement technology. And uh, that was that. And so from then, there was a the middle school, the, the school in which I work at now, you kind of observe my class, you know, my happiness, what was going on, what was taking place. And, and thankfully, he was admired by it. So then um, he asked me to come over. Um, they had a, a position coming open bills where I was in innovative learning. Um, and they had to pretty much grab somebody outside of the school. And so um, he, he said, hey, you know, we need, we need your skill set. We need your passion. You know, we need you. And so um, I applied for the job. Of course, you know, other people applied for the job as well. I was still really nervous, you know, because there were some good candidates and it was really a close call because it's not just him, it's a body of people that you, you know, you have to do an interview in front of. And so um, thankfully, you know, I was chosen. So that's how I got into structural technology. Um, I love it and I enjoy it, but I love it more so uh, for what it does for our children. Um, yeah. And our scholars, you know, um, the demographics are low socioeconomic income. Um, you know, I say 99.9% .9 just to be more statistically correct, but we're pretty much 100% free and reduced lunch. Right. Um, one of the lowest socioeconomic areas in the city of Atlanta. And so I really believe, and I, of course, like, yes, right? Because now I can really leverage technology to engage these scholars, um, ex bring these scholars exposure. It's just so much you can do with technology, um, create, create um, assist the teachers in creating a space that is personalized, that is engaging, yeah. um, and that is effective in their learning and in their learning styles. And just, and of course, technology just allows you to assess those learning styles, right? Um, and then, you know, effectively give that instruction. And so, you know, that's basically what I'm doing now. Of course, you know, we have, you know, different matrix and things like that. But for me, it's all about the student. It's, right. uh, it's, it's just straight up all about the student because our students have different needs, especially when you come to our students. Um, you know, even coming to Atlanta and working the demographics that I work with, it was, it was not quite, it wasn't new to me because I did the same thing in Savannah, but I grew up, right, in a different type of demographic, in a different type of school system. So I wanted to bring the experience, the exposure, the access, you know, the resources that I was familiar with growing up and um, growing up and matriculating through K-12 to the, to the, to these scholars, to these children um, who may not have those same opportunities naturally. And so um, that's what I'm doing now as an tech specialist, and I love it. Um, and it's been great. Um, we have some things happening. Um, you know, uh, we we just announced a, a new lab. So we, we uh, oh, I think I should set up either because we haven't really put it out there yet. But um, <laughs> but uh, uh -oh. Uh, we have a uh -oh. <laughs> uh oh right. Um, let's see it now. But we just have some great things going on um, when it comes to STEM. Um, so I just I'm excited. <laughs> you have like you have like three weeks to announce it before the podcast comes out. 
Okay, so, good, good. So you got like a little so, time to say like, hey, I, I let it slip out. We got about three right. weeks until the podcast was posted. So awesome. So, so you, either, um, you either got ready to announce it or to redo your resume. Either one. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but um, well, we were all, we were able to apply and we received a lab uh, through the Verizon Innovative Learning Grant. Um, yeah. So I've been uh, kind of overseeing that. So we were able to receive that. And offices for STEM curriculums, uh, for, for all the resources, AI, um, v, um, ver, what, virtual reality, reality yep. virtual reality. Yep. Yeah, yep. So we have the courses. I think, and I was just on the actual on the website. The courses are digital production, smart solutions, AI, and robotics, and then immersive media lab. So we have those four courses now that are being offered to us. Um, the resources that come with it, and they're renovating the whole a whole space in the building. Um, so just being able to offer that to our kids, um, something that our scholars have never had. And then it's also going to be a space for our community because I want to offer that space to our community because we, at the end of the day, we kind of, we kind of know where our students come from and that's how we kind of kill that perpetuated cycle of, yeah. um, of, you know, low achievement and things like that. We can't only just reach the scholars. We also have to reach the families. And so I plan on um, using this space just for that. And maybe to hold courses and classes, literacy classes, STEM classes, or just things that can help parents be, better academically sound to support their scholars and so um i'm excited so that's what we're doing over at Prince. okay there's so much i want to like, talk about <laughs> right. here. I love it. Okay. okay first of all so mm -hmm. for anyone who's listening on apple or spotify or whatever this is why mm -hmm. you watch it on youtube so i'm gonna get an image uh it's the alberta education competency wheel now they don't use this anymore but they use it years ago and one of the things that you said when you're talking about ela um mm -hmm. The, the in this wheel that you're seeing on the screen, if you're you know watching on YouTube right now, it basically says literacy and numeracy as the middle, like it is the foundational, and then it talks about all these other aspects that you go, but you have to build that stuff at the core. So like like a, a lot of times, you know, you and I, you know, talk about innovation, educational technology, but what I love what you said is you really kind of start with you know the basics, like and when we basics that you know we need kids who are able to read and write. Like they're not, they're not writing books unless they know how to read and write. So that, mm -hmm. that's a really important aspect of this too. Um, but the, the other thing that you said, and this is, I, I so was like, like, I did everything not to jump in right away because I was so excited about this. Yeah. And years ago when I was an administrator, we had this conversation and we had, um, you know, in, in the school, we had a lot of kids who had access to technologies, things like that at home. And we have access, a bunch of kids who didn't have access to these things. And the mm -hmm. conversation was often like, hey, this is not really fair that some kids um, don't have access to this stuff and they can't bring it to school. So we don't want to identify the haves and the have nots. Mm -hmm. So we don't think anybody should have access to this at school. I'm like, so, okay, so you don't want kids to feel bad. I understand what you're saying, mm -hmm. but what you're doing is you're ensuring the divide becomes bigger. So yes. what we should be focused on is, hey, we have kids who have access to this at home and some who don't. So we need to actually ensure Close everyone again. has access. So yes. it's not like lowering the bar. It's actually, you know, um, going above too. So I, I just, that made me just so, this is why, you know, this is why we connected. I just love right. you know, focus on the work that you do. But the other thing too, there's, oh my God, there's so many things I want to share with you too. When you're talking about this, when you talked about the community thing, we were doing a lot of stuff with technology in a mm -hmm. community that, you know, as you said, a lot of families didn't have access to this stuff. So we took this room at the very front of our building that was used for other things in the past. And we mm -hmm. made it like a family community room and it was like had technology. So any parents could just come in and start using the computer. And it wow. was like, if they were doing online banking, if it, like it was whatever, just right. to get them utilizing it and because they might not have had access to it at home, but if they exactly. get access at school and then they start using it, then they're having different conversations at home. Man, I love that. That's just and awesome. able to support their scholar. Absolutely. That's very I'll, important. I'll tell you, man, you just make me feel <laughs> so validated in so much of the stuff I did in the past because I got pushed back to a lot of the things mm -hmm. too, right? And I'm all about like you, you, you create expectations at, you know, at the suit at the highest level. And so one of the things that we talked about before the podcast, and I think is um, a really important aspect of this too, is when you're talking about educational technology, instructional technology, um, people can come in to, uh, you know, into a classroom and seeing the teacher use technology and think, oh, this is awesome. But if the kids aren't using it, then really, and so you really talked about this before, about really how do you get the kids using this? So how, what are some like ways that you actually help educators focus on how they can help kids 
utilize this in their everyday practice? Like what's something that, you know, if someone who's maybe doing a role similar to yours, how do you help the teachers help the kids utilize this in meaningful ways? I think the first thing that um, I go to is just make sure the students have voice and choice. Um, if the students have voice and choice and then they have a sense of ownership over how they're learning and what they're learning. And so they, when they have a sense of ownership of how they're learning and what they're learning, you won't necessarily always have to, you, it won't be a battle, right? They're being right. engaged. You know, this is, this is what I'm learning and this is how I choose to learn, you know, this using this tool and this technology. So here I am now and I'm ready. You know what I'm saying? So I think when students have a sense of ownership over how they're learning, it's just important. And that's their buying and that's that engagement piece. And so I just, I always encourage teachers, well, you know, how does this student want to display their learning or what's the process in which they would like to choose? Of course, within reason and rationale, right? You, you can't, you know, necessarily, well, I don't want to learn, you know, of course, right, <laughs> I, right, right, I, right. I want to go home and sit on the, you know what I'm saying? But within reason and rationale, just making sure that you understand um, that student and, you know, how, just how they want to learn. And I think that's how you start creating an effective instructional environment around instructional technology. Voice and choice for the student is so important. And then you know you know what that student needs mm -hmm. to necessarily learn whatever it is, the concept that you're teaching or giving instruction to. Well, so the, the, that, that aspect of like giving kids voice and choice, one of the pushbacks mm -hmm. I've had is, so for example, how do I assess it? Like a kid made a video, how do I assess the video? I'm like, you're not assessing the video. Right. You're actually assessing the kid's understanding of the concepts the that are being taught. Yes. That are exactly. through that medium, right? So a lot mm -hmm. of times it's like you're you're getting focused on the tool or the medium as opposed to the message and what the mm -hmm. kid is actually sharing. And mm -hmm. and I know you know you had mentioned you know you had taught science and that's something you're really passionate about. One of the things that I've shared, and I know you're going to appreciate this just by our conversations, is that some of our kids are actually they're not bad at science; they're bad at writing about their understanding of science. That's a very different thing that I just said. So if the assessment is about their ability to write, that's, 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 there's, there's meaning in that, right? You're doing that in Absolutely. a language art class. I get that. Yes, but if it's yes. a science class, but then you're, you're focused on the kid's ability to spell a concept when you know, they understand the science and you're, they're mm -hmm. losing marks. Like there, there's conversation to have about what they write, how they're writing and all that other stuff. But are you focused mm -hmm. on the, what the kid knows about science? So I love that you are giving kids different opportunities to share their learning. And it's not about being so focused on the tool, but you know, can they, can they explain how to use that, right? Can a kid mm -hmm. do a, a one minute TikTok video and show they understand the concept or do they have to do the test? Now, Sorry. one of the pushbacks, and I'm curious about this is, and I don't know, you know, um, well, they still gotta do tests. They still mm -hmm. gotta do tests, right? And there's mm -hmm. a reality of that, you know, states have different, you know, uh, you know, any year. so. How, when a kid has that opportunity to share in that way, how do we still ensure that when the test comes around, they, they still do well? What, what, what are some ways that you maybe you can like help support that? Because it's like, well, they won't be able to do a video when they do the test. Right. So, so how do you, how do you support that process? And so, well, that's a good question. Very good question. And, and it's difficult and it's hard, but it's possible. And I think at the end of the end of the day, while you're still assessing them and they're you're getting, gaining a sense of ownership, and the information, how they're learning and what they're learning, I think then you still, I mean, you still do have to, sometimes you have to still put that, that paper, that test in front of them. But then I think these are moments in, in which you teach test taking skills. I mean, you have, you just, you have to have the holistic instruction or approach, you know what I'm saying? And so right. if you know that child understands the concept or the information, then, you know, you may have to have or uh, something, a small group or something just for that student that says, Hey, I see you're struggling. You understand the concept, but let's understand where's the where's the disconnect. And you have to really personally assess that student on test taking test taking skills. So is it the word that you don't understand? Is it the question style that you don't understand? You know, and a lot of the times because literacy levels are low in our students, that's where they struggle. They struggle with taking tests because they don't even understand the question or they don't understand what they're reading. They understand that they hear it, but they don't understand it if they see it. And right. so then, yes, we have to use, you know, different times and different interventions and be intentional about teaching still those test taking skills. Um, but I think if we marry those two test taking skills, test taking skills, yep. with actually assessing them in the way they want uh, to be assessing the concept, we marry those two. And then, you know, we're still not only training our students to take tests, 
people still teaching our students the content at the same time because we don't want to we don't want to become trainers when it comes to content right, right. um and you want to uh, teach to a test right but we have to understand that there is you're going to be exposed to in your, your adulthood in your life you know what i'm saying yep. so like, you still understand the concept i can see that we still have to make sure that we sharpen these skills in which you can utilize not only here but next level or later on down the road when you do have paper or in front of you and you still have to read the information you still have to check the box for this and check this for that so both of them are important um you just have to find that you just got to do it <laughs> you just got to do it <laughs> you just got to well you know so I, I use this analogy often is that you know so we're big on empowerment voice and choice um mm -hmm. but the irs isn't gonna say hey nice video <laughs> right hey, you gotta fill out the forms that's and how literally I what i saw <laughs> with, hey, you I, forms. I struggle with tax forms and so that's literally yeah. what i saw when i was saying that um <laughs> tax forms so you, you still got that's the skill you still have to learn so you, there's that's there's something. some there's always compliance in the world but I, I think you know the really what is important is that when i i think we can get kids really good at tests but not mm -hmm. really good at learning and they'll be mm -hmm. fine on the test and then what happens after that's like yeah. the big question right and i always say like the most important things that you should be focusing on 10 years from now is what are you doing today? How will it impact the kids you work with 10 years from now? Don't focus on your 10 year plan about kids that aren't even in your building, right? Because they, the kids right now don't care about 10 years from now. They want to know like, what, how's this impacting? And so if a kid is actually doing a, a video or, you know, making a website, explaining a concept and they know it inside out, I always, I believe they'll be fine on the test. There might be some skills there, but I think when we kind of have an overemphasis on just doing tests, we take some learning away from our kids. Mm -hmm. And then, and then I, I, and this is going to, this is going to date me like how old I am. We used to like, you know, our test would start at nine. So like, basically what I would do is I would take the book and I would just look at it like mm -hmm. for into a 58, if to a 59 and just like stare at it. And then as soon as the test start, I would like move the book over and write down as many notes on that piece of paper because I'm not cheating, right? Because I'm right, not right, looking right. at the exact same time. Mm -hmm. And it was really just about like, how do I get what was in this page to this page? Not do I actually understand what's in these pages? Like, do mm -hmm. I understand what this is actually saying? So one of the questions I, I, I have for you, because um, you, you've taught different things, and now you're, you're mostly, you know, working with adults and I'm sure alongside adults, um, with kids as well. How was that? And I know there's a lot of people who probably listen to this podcast because of their, their interest in innovation, uh, things are doing, how was the transition when you moved from, you know, teaching to the role that you're in currently? Um, it was, excuse me. I don't, I don't want to say it was difficult it was it was a pretty good transition um but you have to know your learners i would say right yeah. um, um it's not the same uh while you have students who you know you give instruction to um who may not be as critical of you um who <laughs> for one uh who may not um who there are more so there i'm trying to explain how i see it it's just uh, their bucket is ready, you know what I'm saying, right. for learning to take place. And they don't have too many filters or constrictions kind of to teach through, mm -hmm. right, or train through, right? And so in that aspect, you know, transitioning to now adults where, yes, you have their buckets are open and they're ready, but then I, I feel like sometimes teachers, you have to teach and train through different filters of what yeah. they may know and what they may expect. And I think if anything, that was the hardest transition. And so now sometimes you have to consciously, you know, dig to try to, 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 to separate them from something that may not have, well, that they have used in the past and worked for them in the past, but may not work now, right? right? Because so much has changed um, in this new generation of learners. And I was, look, I was listening to something the other day and they talked about how, that adaptation process uh, or acclimation process of time period has decreased, right? So something new comes out and where it used to take maybe like six years for something else better right. to come out, now it takes like two, right. you know what I'm saying? And so I think a lot of the times instruct, in, in, instructional leaders, teachers, um, 
don't understand that now the acclimation process has decreased. And so, yes, I understand what you used work then, right? And you say, well, it was just four or five years ago, but there's so much now changing in this next generation. Um, yeah. And now we have to be on the forefront of change, right? And so now I have to debunk that, work on that, and then give them something new. Where students, I feel like students are just always ready. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They're always yeah. just ready for the next thing yeah. and ready for that change. And so I think that's been my struggle with um, just, you know, with, between teachers and students, right? Just always having to, you know, maybe debunk something that didn't work because, well, you know, it's always, but I did this and but this worked here and this worked that. Right. And, my thing, and you can still use what works, right? So if that works for you, that works. But sometimes it's, you need to, you know, change something up or tweak something up because the generation and the students and the time in which we are not given instruction is just totally different. And then especially between post-pandemic and uh, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, a lot yeah. cognitively, um, mentally has changed within the students. So we have to also take that in consideration, right? Uh, so we also have to ride that wave of innovation is happening um, um, quicker and, 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 and quicker cycles than it was before. Things are always changing. And so, you know, now we have to learn how to kind of adapt in instruction um, at a quicker pace, if that makes sense. Well, th so and that, that is like such a, that's such an important aspect is um, mm -hmm. how do we see ourselves, the adults, as learners ourselves, that we are constantly willing to grow, adapt, doing the same things. Um, I've used this with groups of educators before that I don't, I always say, I don't use learning norms. That's not my thing. Mm -hmm. I don't say like, mm -hmm. hey, here are the norms for the day, blah, 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 except for this one. All I expect from you is to learn in a way that you'd expect from a student in your class. That's it. And if, and what does that look like? So let's have that conversation. Mm -hmm. What does that look like to you? So if you're grabbing your phone and, you start going on it. I don't care, but you get mad mm -hmm. if a kid does the same thing. Right. And I know adults and kids right. are, you know, we're not the same, but there's sometimes where we're so adamant about, we know what we know and that's it. And I'm guilty of this mm -hmm. too. And then we're maybe not open to learning that we'd expect our kids to be open. Like imagine a kid in grade three going, you know what? I'm good. I don't need math anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> like I don't need this. You mm -hmm. think they're crazy, but we, we will say stuff like this too. One of the things that I thought of when, and this will show how old I am. My first year of teaching, 1999, I was doing a lot of technology stuff. And so I felt like I had to be really well equipped um, and learn some stuff. And I, I bought um, a computer. I can't remember what kind it was. It wasn't an Apple. I, I just know that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was expensive. It was like, it was super expensive, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember my brother knew this stuff really well. Like he was more comfortable. So I like called him and say like, should I get this? Cause this is a pretty big investment for me. And it was like $3,000. And, and uh, cause you know, I was like, that was like one tenth of my salary at the time. Right. So like, like I got paid 30,000 the whole year and $3,000 of that was going to a computer. So I was like nervous about this. And I said, Hey, like it's got 20 gigs of storage. Is that good? He's like, you will never run out of 20, a storage with 20 gigs, right? And now you can't mm -hmm. even get a phone with tw like that low of storage, which is crazy, right? To, I'm, and he like, I remember him saying, you'll never run out of storage, right? Man, and, and, my and, phone and, has, like, has to have a 250. You're right, exactly. Minimum, right? Minimum. <laughs> and like probably, you know, 95% of the stuff you access is in the cloud anyway too, right? Like, and, mm -hmm. and, and think about like all, and that didn't exist and all those other things. So. I think, you know, a lot of this has changed um, so quickly. So, you know, a lot of people, it is uh, March when this is um, is being public or, you know, is being broadcast to the world. And so we're kind of going into that, you know, there's maybe a break, <laughs> there's maybe a break. And then we're like, you know, at the end where we're like, mm -hmm. man, these kids, I'm like, well, sometimes it's us as adults too. Like we're kind of done. Right. We're kind of done for the year too. So right. as people go into the end of the year, that, that final stretch, what's a piece of advice that you could give them as they're kind of looking to end, end the year on a, you know, a positive note um, for themselves and for their students? I think one thing that's always kind of just allowed me to stay focused um, and to finish strong during the school year is school year. It's just to, um, for me to realize that this scholar only goes to this grade one time. Right. And so every, every day they only get this one day in, in fifth grade, sixth grade, fourth grade, whatever grade that scholar may be in one time. 
So we have to make the best of it. We have to finish strong. And once we're finished, you know, we're finished, but we have to, we have to just realize that they only get one of these in their lifetime, right? So we have to give it all we got this one time for them. Now it may look different because we have to go back and do it all again, but not with that particular scholar. And so I think if we hold on to that, you know what I'm saying, it keeps just what we do new and just fresh and to realize, you know what I'm saying, I would never get this opportunity with the same scholar again. So let me give it all I got and let me finish strong. And so I think that, um, or even when I deal with trainings or, or teachers, I may, I will not get the same opportunity again with this person. So in this moment, I'm gonna give it everything that I have and I'm gonna finish strong. So hopefully that encourages you <laughs> to finish the school year strong. Yeah. I love that. That's such good, and that's yeah. true, right? Like that. It. This is it. Mm -hmm. This is their only year mm -hmm. in grade three. This is it. This yeah. is their only yeah. year in grade three. So I love that. So, mm -hmm. so for those of you who don't know, this is Eric's first podcast he's ever done. Absolutely. And here's what I'm telling you. Straight <laughs> up. Here's what I'm telling you straight up. I guarantee it's not your last. It, you're gonna. Wow. I just, just absolutely What's amazing, Eric. And so I'm so glad we've stayed connected. I was glad. Um, selfishly, I asked you on the podcast because we were just talking. I'm like, yeah, you should be on my podcast. Like, I just, I just think right. <laughs> Because uh, I just wanted to just sit and chat with you because I, I think you're just an awesome guy. So here's what I encourage Appreciate people that. to do. If you are listening to this podcast right now, you see how amazing Eric is. He's a very positive light in the world. Follow him on Instagram, but make sure you say hi to him. Just say hi to him and say that you heard him <laughs> on the podcast. Because I think a lot of times we just follow, but we don't actually, you know, mm -hmm. give that a little bit of acknowledgement. Because we were talking earlier, how big of a difference that makes when we acknowledge your kids. We should acknowledge, these, you know, a lot of right. people... Like I know a lot of exactly. people are listening and then they just turn it off and they don't ever, you know, let people know their advice is appreciated. So if you're listening, make sure you give a connection to Eric. Eric is awesome. Just to chat with you. Okay. We're going to, me and you one day are going to start a, a basketball shoe podcast. That's like, Absolutely. you know, <laughs> that's how we met. And, uh, we're so. going to start, we're going to have an app too. Uh, okay. I'm in, I'm in, man. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thanks, man. All right. Everyone. All right. Thanks for All listening. Right. Hope you're watching today. Eric, thanks for being on.